I'm Scott M. Miller and welcome to the vlog. I've had so many people reacting to my videos going into some of the details about the uh, issue in the Essequibo where Venezuela and um, Guyana are arguing about who has uh, legal uh, precedence for control of the land there that I felt I should do some follow-up. Primarily, I've gotten a lot of comments where people have said um, basically a couple different things. Uh, one is that, um, quite frankly, England has a lot of guns and who cares what the law or rights or what is fair. Good luck coming and taking anything and basically anyone who tries to enforce the law over British military might uh, is going to get what's coming to them. So there's been some very colonial imperial post for sure. There's also been some uh, pleas to colonial um, um, heritage with the Guyanese uh, supposedly uh, saying, you know, Guyana has really been mistreated over the history of its of its colonial term and is a very small, uh, nearly powerless country today. They should get some uh, accommodation here simply because they're a small, weak country uh, who has been mistreated historically uh, as a colony. And that that is certainly true. They have had a really rough colonial past that makes things hard for them. Um, that does not really lend any credence to uh, the fact that they may or may not have claim to this region that Venezuela claims is and has always been theirs. So that's a difficult difficult argument uh, to work with. It, it doesn't really uh, make sense. It makes you feel badly that Guyana has been mistreated by England over the long period of time, but that why that would fall to be Venezuela's problem. Uh, that argument is basically one of, we know Venezuela has uh, every claim to this, but please let us have it anyway. We, and we know we cheated you, maybe not us, but England, uh, but ignore the fact that you were cheated so you can have it. So it's, it's not really a good plea, even though it sounds reasonable at first. The next is that, um, you know, the entire argument that Venezuela is making here is that they agreed to an arbitration with England. England agreed to the arbitration with Venezuela. And then when it happened, uh, they were cheated that they did not actually receive the arbitration and that the, the ruling was fake, that England had coerced or, or paid off the arbitrators. That's not to say that that is true, but that is the claim. Um, many of the people who have responded say, well, Venezuela should have no claim here because they agreed to the arbitration. That makes no sense. Literally, the claim being made is that they did agree to the arbitration and the arbitration didn't happen. So then responding, ignoring what that is and saying you agreed to a thing, the fact that it didn't happen is irrelevant, is just admitting the belief of guilt, right? That's, um, you know, you stole this from me. Well, you know, you know, too bad. <laughs> it's very, um, it's very just ignoring the points, um, which very consistently, this is where I've struggled, is, is finding someone who's going to give me points on the Guyanese side. The world seems to favor the Guyanese argument, the Guyanese argument, but, but no one seems to be making that argument. Every time I look at any resources, it's always either, um, blatant disregard for what the Venezuelan points are, which suggests they're being ignored for a reason, um, or Venezuela making points. And someone uh, also said, well, Venezuela has been given ample opportunity to prove that these things happen and they've provided no proof. But that is absolutely not true. And that's why I'm making today's video. I went and found the, uh, the uncorrected, unedited verbatim record from the International Court of Justice at The Hague, uh, where Venezuela provided its remarks. And you may not agree with their, their point on what proof they provided, you may not um, accept that as proof, whatever. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that these things are true. What I'm saying is that this is the argument presented by Venezuela verbatim. I'm going to read the actual ICC uh, uh, court records because Venezuela in 2022, so this is more than a year ago, most certainly did provide some evidence as to two things. One, why the case at the ICC is not relevant because it is disputing something between uh, Guyana and um, uh, Venezuela that is actually between the United Kingdom and Venezuela. And importantly, the United Kingdom never gave the uh, right to uh, dispute the Essequibo region to Guyana when it became a sovereign state. So it has maintained that, which in itself along with the shared monarchy, are both uh, evidence of not actually being sovereign in some ways. But no matter whether you how you look at the sovereign question of Guyana, uh, they do not have the right 
to argue in court for this region that has been withheld from them prior to their, their sovereign uh, separation from uh, their colonial status. And so Venezuela argues on one side that the ICC has no ruling here because the parties that the ruling would be about are not present or invited. Uh, Guyana does not have the right to call an ICC arbitration over this situation because the UK is not invited to the table and not present at the table. And secondly, then, uh, so so that's the first piece. Venezuela provides that, I think, very adequately. Um, but you can dispute that if you like, but they certainly provide evidence. And then the second piece of evidence is they show why the 1899 agreement, the arbitration, never happened. And again, you cannot agree with their points, but you can't say they didn't make them. So all the people who are saying that Venezuela never made a point all the ones who say they should abide by the arbitration, all those, all of that is handled. All of that, anyone who says that, you can assume very safely, believes Venezuela's point and is trying to browbeat you. They're not using facts or logic. And so I want to read this because I think if you hear Venezuela's point, until you hear someone provide evidence to the contrary, and very importantly, basically everything that they say is backed up by the United States, included by including uh, at least one of the pieces by a sitting president made similar statements as to false records being entered uh, by the UK prior to the the arbitration, right? The United States had already recognized false maps being used at the presidential level. Like you can't get any higher, right, in the United States. Um, and so, so these are very good arguments, I think, that Venezuela makes. And again, Guyana may have amazing counter arguments to this that we haven't heard yet or that I have not found yet or that no one is telling me, but the fact that nobody is presenting any of them to me, yet getting very agitated that Venezuela has points, is telling to some degree. And the fact that people are directly denying the, the provable pieces that Venezuela has um, and pretending it doesn't happen also says a lot about their very strong emotional ties to their belief that Venezuela is in the right and that this is they need to come up with a way to stall them or threaten them or whatever uh, to keep them from, from making good on their claim that they need to, to, to take back this region. So this is from the 17th of November, 2022, on a Thursday at the Peace Palace in The Hague uh, with uh, President uh, Donahue presiding. And I'm going to read for you verbatim the, the Venezuelan remarks because I think they explain a lot of, of why we should be taking Venezuela's position here at least seriously. There is a small starting portion here that is in French due to a lack of translation to English until point four. Starting on page 16 of the verbatim notes, this is the opening remarks by Venezuela in English, and I think you get everything that you really need from this point. So while this is a fairly dry legal filing, it is the international uh, court, it is incredibly important, and I think it's it's pretty easy to follow very, very clearly. There, there's no hiding here, there's no couching uh, what, what is believed to have happened. So I'm just going to read from the record. Distinguished judges, Guyana filed a unilateral application requesting a ruling on the validity of the arbitration award of 1899. Venezuela maintains that the object of and the reason why the Geneva Agreement was signed in 1966 is that of seeking satisfactory solutions for the practical settlement of the controversy between Venezuela and the United Kingdom, which has arisen as a result of the Venezuelan contention that the arbitral award of 1899 is null and void. Point five. Nothing in the Geneva Agreement indicates that the parties agreed to resolve the nullity or the validity of the award. That is an absolute irrelevant matter considering it was settled by the Geneva Agreement itself. Point six. On the contrary, the United Kingdom and Venezuela reached an agreement which constitutes a les speciali between the parties. As exhaustively and expressly stated in this title, agreement to resolve the controversy between Venezuela and the United Kingdom. Point seven. It cannot be understood how Guyana now intends to escape from the practical settlement of the dispute with its claim, since it is impossible through a practical settlement to amicably resolve whether or not the award is valid. Point eight. There is a serious problem of admissibility that affects the litigious object and the applicant and respondent that is revealed with such force that it makes it impossible to continue with the merits of the application filed by Guyana. Point nine. Furthermore, an application has been filed against Venezuela by someone who did not participate in the fraud of 1899, even though Guyana, together with the United Kingdom, recognized in 1966 the Venezuelan claim, thus committing itself to an amicable settlement through its subsequent ascension to the Geneva Agreement. 
Point 10. The current misguided and ill-intentioned interpretation of the agreement by Guyana affects the rights of the Venezuelan people and vital interests of the Republic, specifically its territorial integrity. For this reason, Venezuela, in compliance with its constitutional duty and accordance with international law, filed preliminary objections to the admissibility of the application in question and appears in this incidental phase to note that the court should not admit Guyana's application. Point 12. We admit that this court would not be in a position to resolve Guyana's application because the United Kingdom, the indispensable party to settle the subject matter of the dispute requested by Guyana, is not participating. Point 13. I would like to clarify some historical and factual aspects that put Venezuela's position in context. 14. In 1777, the Spanish crown created the Capitania General de Venezuela, made up of the provinces of Venezuela, Cumaná, Guyana, Maracaibo, Margarita and Trinidad, as you can see on the map that is projected on the screen. 15. This administrative unit is the territorial source of what later became the Republic of Venezuela that was born with its Declaration of Independence and its Constitution of 1811. As from that time, the Venezuelan constitutional history reflects the belonging of the Guyana Esquiba province to the Venezuelan territory. 16. In 1825, the United Kingdom recognized Gran Colombia, which had as its eastern boundary the territory of Venezuela's Guayana Esquiba. Esquiba. Point 17. The United Kingdom never, never had title over the territory of Guayana Esquiba. 18. Three constants can be identified from 1841 to 1895. The first is Venezuela's permanent protest against the British falsehoods and imperial threats. 19. The second is Venezuela's sustained willingness to resolve the situation through peaceful, amicable, and direct means. 20. The third is the re, uh, reiterated territorial dispossession attempt by an empire located 12,000 kilometers away in London, the capital city of the British Empire. 21. Throughout the 19th century, the British government sought to unilaterally assert new land rights by publishing doctored maps containing falsified borderlines in its favor, and also claimed that the boundaries were not subject to negotiation as they would be defended by use of force, thus reaffirming the British imperial veracity for the gold mines and other natural resources of the territory. 22. Given such circumstances of abuse of sovereignty and dispossession, Venezuela sought the assistance of third parties to ease tensions and protect its territory. 23. The intervention of the United States as Venezuela's representative in the negotiations opened a new stage in the territorial controversy between Venezuela and Great Britain, in which the interests of the world's largest imperial power in the world, Great Britain, clashed with those of an emerging power, the United States, that seeks to impose its hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. 24. An arbitration agreement was organized where all the pieces were arranged to give way to a fraud through deception. The aim of the United Kingdom was to steal the Venezuelan territory for geopolitical and economic reasons. 25. Madam President, distinguished judges, much of my address has focused on, on the United Kingdom. This responds to the fact that the, in this story there are two protagonists, the colonial power of the United Kingdom, the land grabber, and Venezuela, the victim. 26. Guyana lacked existence as a subject of international law at the time when the fraud was cons consummated. 27. The Cooperative Republic of Guyana came into existence as a republic after the signing of the Geneva Agreement, being fundamental in the territorial controversy. 28. Madam President, distinguished judges, in his well-known 1949 memorandum, Malay Provence recounted the fraudulent and deceptive actions against Venezuela. 29. Provence revelation prompted further research carried out by Venezuelan historians in the official archives of Great Britain and the United States who obtained abundant, unknown historical evidence. 30. These new documentary findings contributed to confirming the fraud committed by the United Kingdom in the arbitration. 31. It is completely consistent that Venezuela, following the discovery of the fraud of the Arbitral Award of 1899, denounced the situation within the United Nations General Assembly in 1962. 32. If the Venezuelan claim was absurd, would the United Kingdom have spent four years of negotiations from 1962 to 1966? The answer is no. 33. If such negotiations had not revealed that something was seriously wrong with the award, the United Kingdom would never have confirmed the Venezuelan contention that the award was invalid. 34. In direct connection with arbitration fraud, it is now beginning to be revealed how the United Kingdom acted disloyally, lying during the formulation of the Geneva Agreement and signing a commitment to reaching an amicable and practical settlement, the compliance of which is still awaited. In reality, what the United Kingdom did was covering up its improper behavior. 35. And evidence of that is the note of November 1963 from the British Embassy in Caracas to the Foreign Office in London. Quote, Sooner or later, the Venezuelan government would have to be told that Her Majesty's government could not agree to modification of British Guyana and Venezuela frontier. 
The problem was how and when to convey this information. End quote. 36. Madam President, this court was found that it has jurisdiction to examine the validity of the award in its decision of December 2020. But how could the court examine the validity of the award without the participation of the United Kingdom? 37. How would the determination of the validity or nullity of the award be reached without the concurrence of the main actor, the United Kingdom, who, in its pursuit of profit, acted against a sovereign state? It would involve the examination of the United Kingdom's conduct. 38. This is the situation that underpins Venezuela's preliminary objections. That is the need to determine the actions and consequent responsibility of an indispensable party to this proceedings, the United Kingdom. 39. Madam President, distinguished judges, it is now necessary to understand how we arrived at Guyana's unilateral application. 40. At the beginning of 2015, the entire relationship changed in the search for an amicable settlement. Guyana, spurred by the energy transnationals that have been behind this territorial controversy for decades, seized the opportunity to accelerate its action with a view to a claim on the validity of the award. 41. These same transnationals, a third party that would have nothing to look for in this litigation, are the ones funding Guyana's legal assistance in this proceeding before the court. 42. After decades of prospections with few results, in 2015, the American oil company ExxonMobil announced a world-famous discovery. Quoted, It is the same year that Guyana forgets about the good officer and abandons the, the negotiations. 43. Guyana began, uh, begun an oil adventure by unilaterally granting large concessions to transnational companies which Venezuela has constantly protested. In doing so, Guyana has destroyed the environment of Guyana's Guayana Esequiba territorial with its illegal actions. 44. Guyana ignores the ruling of the Geneva Agreement to resolve the territorial controversy affecting the territorial integrity of Venezuela with its illegal prospections, going so far as to make incursions into disputed territorial waters of Venezuela. 45. Madam President, distinguished judges, for my country it is fundamental to make clear that, contrary to what Guyana has said, Venezuela's preliminary objections are not an appeal to the court's judgment on jurisdiction. 46. Venezuela understands the particular rejudicata effects on jur jurisdiction of the 2020 judgment, regardless of whether it is adverse to the interest of Venezuela. Venezuela's objections refer only to the admissibility of Guyana's application. 47. Venezuela's objections are based on the following fact. First, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Venezuela were parties to the Washington Treaty. The Cooperative Republic of Guyana was not. Second, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Venezuela were parties to the arbitration that gave rise to the award of 1899. The Cooperative Republic of Guyana was not. Third, the United Kingdom remains a party to the Geneva Agreement. Fourth, the United Kingdom, the indispensable party for this application, is not in this room. 48. These give rise to the following legal consequence. Venezuela cannot dispute the rights and obligations of the conduct of a state that is absent from these proceedings and whose participation cannot be enjoined by this court. 49. So, due to the absence of the indispensable party, the court must declare Guyana's application inadmissible and will be clearly demonstrated in these hearings. 50. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, Professors Andrea Zimmerman, Esperanza Orejuela, Carlos Esposito, Christian Tams, Paolo Falcetti, and Antonio Ramiro Rotons will demonstrate that Venezuela's preliminary objection is admissible. 51. Madam President, Venezuela is committed to practicing tolerance and living together in peace with one another as good neighbors, as set forth in the Charter of the United Nations. That is why we extend once again our hand to Guyana to settle the existential territorial controversy abiding by the Geneva Agreement. A decision by this court rejecting the application unilaterally filed by Guyana will contribute in a positive and constructive manner to said purpose through the correct administration of justice. 52. Finally, to Venezuela, this matter is in the soul of our homeland. Today we say with our liberator, Simon Bolivar, Primero el suelo nativo que nada. Nuestra vida no es otra cosa que la herencia de nuestro país. First and foremost, our native land, our life is nothing but the heritage of our homeland. Many thanks, distinguished judges and Madam President. The President. I thank the Executive Vice President of Venezuela for her statement. I now invite Professor Andreas Zimmerman to take the floor. You have the floor, Professor. Venezuela's preliminary objection is admissible. A. Introduction. 1. Madam President, members of the court, it is once again an honor to appear before this court and to do so this time on behalf of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. 2. In the following, I will now demonstrate that Venezuela's preliminary objection is admissible and I will be brief. And I will be rather brief because its admissibility cannot seriously be questioned. B. Jurisdiction and admissibility distinguished. 
Three, members of the court, in its practice, the court has always carefully distinguished between the question whether it has jurisdiction to hear a case on one hand and whether it may exercise such jurisdiction once established, i.e., whether a case is admissible on the other hand. Four, this crucial distinction has inter alia been confirmed in the court's 2008 judgment in the Croatian genocide case. There, the court confirmed a distinction between these two kinds of objections, i.e., between an objection to jurisdiction and one going to the admissibility of the claims, is well recognized in the practice of the court. 5. The court, you, then continued quoting the judgment of the oil platforms case that objections to admissibility normally take the form of, a mis of an assertion that even if the court has jurisdiction and the facts stated by the application state are assumed to be correct, nonetheless there are reasons why the court should not proceed to an examination of the merits. 6. Hence, an objection to admissibility consists in the contention that there exists a legal reason even where there is jurisdiction why the court should decline to hear the case. 7. The distinction between these two categories of issues and preliminary objections is thus clear and well established. Accordingly, a judgment dealing with jurisdiction issues and determining that the court does have jurisdiction in a given case does not, does not, dispose at the same time of a preliminary objection that relates to the admissibility of the application. 8. This crucial distinction between jurisdiction on the one hand and admissibility on the other is also mirrored in the court's practice when calling upon parties what to address in their pleadings devoted to their respective preliminary objections. 9. Thus, in the two nuclear test cases, one of the nuclear disarmament cases, namely the one involving Pakistan, and most recently, as you can see, in the case between the state of Palestine and the United States, the court ordered the parties in their pleadings on possible preliminary objections to address both issues of jurisdiction and admissibility. 10. In sharp contrast, there are two in the first two fisheries jurisdiction cases between Germany and the United Kingdom versus Iceland in the Aegean Continental Shelf case, as well as most notably in another one of the nuclear disarmament Marshall Islands versus India cases, the court specifically told the parties to exclusively focus on jurisdictional issues, jurisdictional issues only. 11. As you can see, and what is thus obviously particularly relevant now, the very same holds true for the case before you today, the case between Guyana and Venezuela. In your order of the 19th of June, 2018, the court told the parties to only address issues of jurisdiction and not simultaneously also matters of admissibility. 12. Guyana, as well as Venezuela, heeded that call, and indeed, how could it be otherwise? Both parties, Guyana in its memorial of 19 November 2018, and Venezuela, despite not formally participating in this part of the proceedings, in its memorandum of 28 November 2019, thus only argued matters of jurisdiction, but not yet issues that related to the admissibility of Guyana's application. What is now brought out by this long-established practice is that the court has clearly established a distinction whether the subsequent phase of a given case dealing with the issue of preliminary objection should cover jurisdiction and admissibility or matters of jurisdiction only. Guyana's claim that Venezuela's preliminary objection as to the admissibility of Guyana's application should be rejected is thus, I may, might say, misleading. It seems that it is for that very reason that Guyana in its written observations is trying to blur the red line between these two categories of preliminary objections. It does so by consistently referring to the question of whether the court has jurisdiction or not, and does so even when discussing Venezuela's preliminary objection with clearly does which clearly does not claim that the court lacks jurisdiction. 14. That brings me to my next point, namely the character of the mon mon monetary gold principle as a challenge to the admissibility of a case brought rather than a challenge relating to the court's jurisdiction. 15. Or to put it otherwise, I will now show that the monetary gold objection is one that relates to the exercise of jurisdiction by the court and not to the existence or non-existence of its jurisdiction. Monetary gold principle-based objection as an objection to admissibility. 16. This qualification, apart from being shared by quite a number of academic commentators as well as by counsel pleading for Nauru in 1995, was already confirmed by the monetary gold judgment itself where the court found that although Italy and the three respondent states have conferred jurisdiction upon the court, it, the court, cannot exercise this jurisdiction. 17. Ever since the court has confirmed this qualification, notably in the certain phosphate lands in Nauru case, the court in its judgment first considered the question of its jurisdiction, it then, and only in a subsequent step, considered the separate question of whether Nauru's application was inadmissible on the basis of the monetary gold principle, finding that the court was not, could not decline to exercise its previously established judgment. 
18. On the whole, it cannot be thus be doubted that the preliminary objection like the one submitted by Venezuela, which is based on the fact that a third state, i.e., in the case at hand, the United Kingdom, is an indispensable party to the proceedings, relates to the admissibility of the case rather than to the court's jurisdiction. The said objection is therefore not barred by the res judicata effects of the court's judgment on the 18th of December 2020, which dealt exclusively with the court's jurisdiction. Venezuela's preliminary objection and the 2020 judgment on jurisdiction. 19. Madam President, members of the court, in its attempt to nevertheless support its hypothesis that Venezuela's preliminary objection is not admissible, Guyana argues that said objection constitutes an attack on the court's jurisdiction, already established by the court's judgment, that it is merely a misguided attempt to persuade the court to revisit or revise said judgment, and that it is meant to be an appeal against it. 20. While I congratulate our colleagues for being so eloquent, all these allegations boil down one way or the other to a single one, namely that Venezuela is barred from raising its preliminary objection related to the admissibility of Guyana's application due to the res judicata character of the court's December 2020 judgment. 21. In that regard, let me start reiterating that Venezuela continues to strongly believe that the December 2020 judgment was wrongly decided and that Guyana's application is not only inadmissible, but that the court also lacks jurisdiction to entertain the case in the first place. 22. But be that as it may, Venezuela acknowledges that the December 2020 judgment has the force of res judicata as between the parties. Indeed, how could it be otherwise, given that the court has on several occasions, and notably in its 2007 merits judgment on the Bosnian genocide case, stressed that even judgments on judication possess a res judicata character. 23. But, and this is an important and crucial but, but such res judicata effect only extends to what has been really decided in such a jurisdictional holding, either expressis verbis or by necessary implication. As this court put it in its 2007 judgment in the Bosnian genocide case, in respect of a particular judgment, it may be necessary to distinguish between, first, the issues which have been decided with the force of res judicata and which are necessarily entailed in the decision of those issues, and matters which have not been ruled upon at all. If a matter has not in fact been determined expressly or by necessary implication, then no force of res judicata attaches to it. 24. Applied to the case now before you, Guyana would have to have argued in its written observations that the court's 2020 judgment on jurisdiction, and let me reiterate that it was not a judgment on jurisdiction and admissibility, but one on jurisdiction only, that this judgment on jurisdiction had, by the same token, nevertheless, decided the admissibility issue we are now discussing today and tomorrow. 25. And Guyana would have to have argued that the... would have had to argue that the court did so without even giving the slightest hint in the judgment that the court wanted to do this. It is obviously true that Guyana itself had, both in its memorial and in its final oral submission, requested the court to find that it has jurisdiction to hear the claims presented by Guyana and that these claims are admissible. And this fact is duly recorded in the usual descriptive part, descriptive part of the court's judgment. Yet, 26, on the same occasion, the court also notes that Venezuela had solely contended that the court lacks jurisdiction to entertain the case. It is in light of this divergence of views on the court's jurisdiction that the court then in the operative part of the 2020 judgment merely decided on that very issue, namely whether it has jurisdiction or not. 27. This limitation of the res judicata of the said judgment is further confirmed by the fact that the court specifically addresses and decided two jurisdictional sub-questions relating to the court's jurisdiction, rationé materie and rationé tempori, respective in the 2020 judgment. 28. Besides, I might also briefly recall what I said at the beginning of my statement, namely that the court had, from the outset, deliberately, and unlike in other recent cases such as the Palestine versus United States of America case, asked the parties to solely discuss the court's jurisdiction. 29. Guyana thus now would have to have would have had to argue that, as the Bosnian genocide judgment put it, the issue of the admissibility of Guyana's case was an element in the reasoning of the judgment which can, and indeed must, be read into the judgment as a matter of logical construction. 30. Or to put it otherwise, the court's 2020 finding on jurisdiction would have to constitute, as you put it in 2007, a finding which is only consistent in law and logic with the proposition that the case is also admissible. 31. Besides, now finding that Guyana's application is inadmissible would, to again use the court's 2007 formula, have to contradict the finding of jurisdiction made in the earlier judgment. 32. Madam President, members of the court, but where is such a necessary implication to be found in the December 2020 judgment? 33. Where can we find a necessary implication allegedly extending the scope of its res judicata to matters of admissibility? 34. 
And where can we find a necessary implication that the court had meant in its 2020 judgment not only to address, but also to decide with force of res judicata the issue of the United Kingdom being a necessary third party within the meaning of the court's monetary gold jurisprudence? 35. Having read and reread time and again both the judgment itself and Guyana's written observations, I have to admit that I failed at least to detect such necessary implication. 36. Now, obviously, I do not blame the court because the answer is simple. From the outset, both the court as well as the parties were solely concerned with and focused on the scope of the court's jurisdiction under the 1966 Geneva Agreement. Hence, no indication is to be found of any such necessary implication in the court's 2020 judgment, as also having decided the issue of the, in of the admissibility of Venezuela's preliminary objection now before the court. 37. Let me end with a final remark which further confirms the admissibility of Venezuela's preliminary objection. Only the court's 2020 judgment and Guyana's memorial revealed the application, applicability of the monetary gold principle. 38. Members of the court, it was only the court's own 2020 judgment on jurisdiction and Guyana's own memorial which, contrary to Guyana's original much broader claims, made in its application revealed what the court would have to rule on and should the case ever reach the merits phase. 39. It was only after the court's judgment that it had become clear that during a possible merits phase, the court would not consider events that occurred after British Guyana had gained independence. 40. And it was only, uh, and it was thus only at this point that it also became clear that the court would not consider the course of the land boundary as such, with that issue being obviously of concern for Guyana and Venezuela only and not the United Kingdom. 41. Rather, your judgment, the court's 2020 judgment, revealed that, in the case at hand, the court has to necessarily decide upon the validity or invalidity of the 1899 award, yet it was the United Kingdom, not Guyana, who was party to those proceedings, and it was also the United Kingdom, as will subsequently be shown by my colleagues in detail, not Guyana, the United Kingdom, that interfered in these proceedings in violation of international law. Rather, your judgment, the court's 2020 judgment, revealed that, in the case at hand, the court has to necessarily decide upon the validity or invalidity of the 1899 award. Yet, it was the United Kingdom, not Guyana, that was party to those proceedings, and it was also the United Kingdom, as it will subsequently be shown by my colleagues in detail, not Guyana, the United Kingdom, that interfered in these proceedings in violation of international law. 42. It was accordingly only once the court had rendered its 2020 judgment, which Venezuela accepts, has become res judicata as far as the court's jurisdiction is concerned. It was then only that it became apparent that the United Kingdom is an indispensable third party within the meaning of the court's monetary gold jurisprudence. 43. Following up on the court's judgment, Guyana's subsequent memorial itself then contained manifold references to the behavior by the United Kingdom related to the arbitral proceedings, including but not limited to issues of fraud, error, and corruption, all committed or not committed by the United Kingdom. 44. It was therefore only after Venezuela had become aware of the court's 2020 judgment, and after it had become aware of the position taken by Guyana itself that Venezuela decided, and indeed could decide, to submit a preliminary objection related to the admissibility of Guyana's application. As a matter of fact, it had only by then become clear that the United Kingdom is and remains a necessary third party in these proceedings within the meaning of the court's monetary gold jurisprudence. 45. And it is on this very basis and in line with the court's well-established jurisprudence and a sound administration of justice that the court must therefore now consider Venezuela's admissibility-related preliminary objection. Conclusion Madam President, members of the court, on the whole, I therefore submit to you that it cannot be seriously doubted that Venezuela was entitled to bring this preliminary objection we are now discussing, and my colleagues will now further demonstrate that this objection must also be entertained. 47. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you for your kind attention and kindly request you, Madam President, to now give the floor to my colleague, Professor Esperanza Aurelia. Thank you very much. We now have a section in French. The facts portion was originally presented in French. Facts part one is in French. Facts part two is in English. I'm not sure why they switch back and forth. This is part two. They allude to what is said in part one. Facts two, introduction one. Madam President, members of the court, excellencies, it is an honor to appear before you to continue the pleading of Venezuela. 2. Professor Orwellia has already presented pertinent facts as to the United Kingdom's fraudulent conduct in relation to the 1897 arbitration agreement described as early as 12 December 1896 by a former minister of Venezuela to the court of St. James, Mr. Tomas Michelena, as an English trick. In this part, I will address yet another set of fraudulent behavior by the United Kingdom relating to the arbitration proceedings. Venezuela submits that a judgment of the court on the merits of this case would imply the evaluation of the lawlessness of these conducts attributed to the United Kingdom, which is not a party to this case. 
three. More specifically, Venezuela contends that there have been several instances of fraudulent conduct by lawyers and high-ranking officials of Great Britain that affect the validity of the arbitral proceedings, which lawfulness the court would need to evaluate to arrive to a decision on the merits of this case. Our task is to substantiate our preliminary objections and provide the correct factual and legal view of our position. To do so, Excellencies, we need to unavoidably refer to certain facts that demonstrate and confirm that the court cannot decide the case in the absence of the United Kingdom, as it is an indispensable party within the meaning of the monetary gold principle. 4. The facts that make the presence of Great Britain an indispensable party in this case are already present in Guyana's memorial. Indeed, in its memorial, Guyana requests the court to rule on the validity of the award of 3rd October 1899 in relation to coercive and fraudulent conduct by the United Kingdom that, in Venezuela's view, renders the award null and void. Now, obviously, Guyana and Venezuela disagree as to whether such coercive and fraudulent conduct by the United Kingdom took place or not. They are also disagree on its legal effects, but Guyana and Venezuela do agree that it is the alleged illegal behavior of the United Kingdom that lies at the core of the dispute, and were the court to ever consider the merits, it would have to necessarily decide this issue which constitutes part of the very subject matter of the case. 5. I will now focus on two specific types of fraudulent conduct by British lawyers and high-ranking officials, which lawfulness the court would need to evaluate if it were to determine the validity of the arbitral award, making the United Kingdom an indispensable party in Guyana's case, hence inadmissible. Fraudulent conduct by British lawyers during the arbitration proceedings. 6. Excellent. <clears throat> Excellencies, firstly, I will address the fraudulent conduct by British lawyers during the arbitration proceedings. Proper conduct of counsel is essential to the validity of arbitration proceedings. Improper conduct of counsel in collusion with arbitrators affects the very essence of the judicial function. Regarding the 1899 arbitral award, there are, however, serious indications that lawyers from Great Britain had improper exchanges with the arbitrators appointed by Great Britain. I refer to letters from Sir Richard Webster, Britain's senior counsel, to Lord Salisbury, Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, and to Mr. Joseph Chamberlain, the Colonial Minister of Great Britain. This correspondence indicates a fraudulent conduct between party lawyers and, in Webster's own words, our arbiters. 7. In a letter dated the 19th of July, 1899, while the arbitration proceedings were taking place in Paris, Sir Richard Webster writes to Lord Salisbury to assure him that he is fully aware of the importance of obtaining Point Barima for Great Britain, and said, I do not propose to make any concession. If I have any reason to believe the tribunal is against me on this part of the case, I shall endeavor to let the British arbiters know our view of the position. 8. On the same day, Sir Richard Webster wrote to Mr. Joseph Chamberlain, Minister of Colonies, to ask for guidance and to let him know his position to be prepared in case the court asks him questions publicly or privately. Once again, Sir Richard Webster writes, quote, If I find it necessary to take any independent, I shall do so privately through our own arbitrators, and only when I am satisfied that having regard to expressions of opinion of the part of some members of the tribunal, it is desirable that our arbitrators should appreciate our views. 9. On the 3rd of October, 1899, the day the arbitral award is made public, Webster writes letters to Chamberlain and Salisbury to express his satisfaction with the outcome of the arbitration, which he considers a great success for Great Britain. In both letters, let Webster request a meeting in private because there are things he cannot reveal in public. In his letter to Chamberlain, he literally says, quote, When you can spare me a few minutes, there are one or two matters in connection with the arbitration as to which I should like to talk to you. I cannot very well put them in writing. 10. Webster uses the same words in his letter to Lord Salisbury of the 3rd of October, 1899. He writes, quote, There are one or two important matters in connection with the arbitration which I cannot very well put in writing. 11. Venezuela considers that these statements by the lead counsel for Great Britain prove an inappropriate relationship of those lawyers and, in their own words, their arbitrators. They involve the representatives and organs of Great Britain and are attributable to Great Britain. They are capable of not only rendering the arbitral award null and void, but also triggering the international responsibility of their state under international law. Such fraudulent conduct vitiates any arbitral proceedings and is unjustifiable in 89, 1899 as it is today. Ruling on the lawfulness of these conducts would imply an evaluation of the lawfulness of the conduct of a state which is not a party to these proceedings. Adulteration of maps submitted to the arbitral tribunal. 12. Excellencies, another key issue that the court will have to address if the case were to reach the merits concerned the adulteration of maps by British officials submitted to the arbitral tribunal. 
13. Guyana argues in its memorial that maps at the time usually contained inaccuracies, and that in any case there is no evidence that those maps were decisive for the decision taken by the arbitral tribunal. Contrary to what Guyana affirms, Venezuela firmly believes that these maps had a decisive influence on the solution adopted by the tribunal. This is evidenced by the boundary line finally established in the award. Indeed, the arbitral tribunal granted, without giving any legal grounds, almost the totality of the disputed territory to Great Britain based on adulterated maps. 14. The relevant facts were well established already in the report submitted by the Venezuelan experts to the national government on the issue of the boundaries with British Guiana, published in 1965. The first maps of 1835 by geo geographer Robert Schomburg respected the boundary line fixed on the Esequibo River. That is the green line on the map on your right. The map published in 1840 severely altered that boundary with a new line known as the Schomburg Line. That is the blue line on the map on the screen. The line became the core of the British strategy to increase the territory of British Guiana at the expense of the sovereign rights of Venezuela. But even Schomburg, who worked for the Royal Geographical Society and the Colonial Office, and was knighted despite being a German national, warned that such a boundary should be agreed upon between both countries. All British leaders up to Lord Salisbury in the 1880s had recognized those lands as Venezuelan territories or at least as controversial territories. Lord Aberdeen, in a statement, he was at that time Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, illustrates this. Lord Aberdeen had recognized on the 31st of January, 1842, that the posts that had been installed by Great Britain were not indications of dominion and empire on the part of Great Britain. Rather, they were merely a preliminary measure open to future discussion between the two governments, something that was reflected in the crucial agreement of 1850 that was intended to preserve Venezuela's rights against British incursion and illegitimate advances into its territory. 15. In the 1880s, however, Great Britain changed its view of the second Schomburg line as originally established, that is, as a mere British claim. Let us recall that the first Schomburg map of 1835 recognized the Essequibo River as the boundary between Venezuela and British Guiana. The second Schomburg line dramatically increased the territory of British Guiana and became a boundary of what Great Britain considered their undisputed territory. The point to be emphasized here is that the Schomburg line was fraudulently altered in the 1880s, as you can see observing the red line of the map projected on the screen. Indeed, in the maps published by Schomburg in 1840, 1841, and 1847, in his reports, the line drawn crosses Cuyuni and the Southern Basin. This was reflected in the numerous maps published by the British government and in the colonial list, including the famous 1875 map published by Mr. Stanford in 1876 on behalf of the colonial government known as the Schomburg map. 16. In 1886, a new map was published at the initiative of the colonial office that enlarged the line drawn by Sir Robert Schomburg, which had died more than two decades earlier. This new map covered the Great Bend of the Cuyuni. This map was published in 1886, but continued to bear the publication date of the earlier 1875 map, as Counsel James Storrow and legal advisor William Shrugs explained in their brief for Venezuela in 1890 before the Venezuelan Boundary Commission established by the United States Congress. The new line first invented or asserted in 1886 thus appeared as if it were the original line of 1875, supported by the authorities of the surveyors whose names still appear on the map as before. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Salisbury, however, referred to that line on 13th February 1890 as the line surveyed by Sir Richard Schombach in 1841. 17. These adulterations were pointed out by Sir Edward Hertzlet, Librarian of the Foreign Office at that time. In his mem memorandum of the 1st of June 1886, Hertzlet highlighted the adulterations in the map published by Mr. Stanford in 1875 for the Colonial Office of Great Britain. He recommended including a note stating that it was a corrected map, and he also underlined the note that appeared on the original map. The note erased from the original map read, quote, The boundaries indicated in this map are those laid down by the late Sir Robert Schombach, who was engaged in exploring the colony during the years 1835 to 1839 under the direction of the Royal Geographic Society. But the boundaries thus laid down between Brazil on the one side and Venezuela on the other, and the colony of British Guiana must not be taken as authoritative, as they have never been adjusted by the respective governments, and an engage engagement subsists between the governments of Great Britain and Venezuela, by which neither is at liberty to encroach upon or occupy territory claimed by both. In a letter of 14th June 1886, included in the report by Gonzalez Oropeza and O'Hare, already cited Sir Edward Hertzlake stated clearly that their case was a poor one indeed because the map sent to the Venezuelan government in 1899, 1891 was inaccurate and the map published by the Ministry of Colonies in 1875 was all wrong. 19. 
The fact that in June 1886, Sir Robert Herbert, Permanent Undersecretary of State for the Colonies, by direction of Earl Granville, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, ordered the boundary to be corrected and all copies of the map in existence to be destroyed. Great Britain used these maps with an adulterated boundary line that coincided with the so-called Schomburg Line of 1886. 20. Excellencies, what is relevant at this point is not whether there were modifications to the maps prior to the proceedings, nor whether they were known to both parties, as alleged in Guyana's memorial. What is relevant, Your Excellencies, is that Great Britain knowingly submitted doctored maps to the Arbitral Tribunal, a fraudulent conduct that undermines the establishment of the truth by the Arbitral Tribunal and impedes the proper exercise of judicial function. 21. Venezuela submits that the decisive character of these adulterated maps is showed by observing the coincidence between the lines of the adulterated maps and the boundary finally established by the arbitral tribunal. Again, Guyana disputes this, but what is important is that once again, if the court were to ever deal with the merits of the case, it would necessarily find, first and foremost, consider and decide the question whether the United Kingdom deliberately submitted falsified maps to the arbitral tribunal, not only eventually rendering its award null and void, but also engaging in the United Kingdom's international responsibility for disenfranchising Venezuela of an essential part of its sovereign territory. Conclusion 22. Excellencies, the facts clearly show that the actions of the United Kingdom are one of the essential reasons for the nullity of the arbitral award of 3rd of October 1899. To determine the validity of the award, it would be necessary to evaluate the lawfulness of its conduct. At this point, of course, we do not intend to discuss Guyana's arguments on the merits. Our submissions are only intended to confirm Venezuela's conviction that the United Kingdom is an indispensable party and that the court therefore cannot rule on the validity of the arbitral award of 3rd October 1899 in the arbitration between Venezuela and Great Britain because the United Kingdom is not a party to this case. 23. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Madam President, I now respectfully ask that you call my colleague, Professor Christian Tams, to continue Venezuela's pleadings, and thank you, Excellencies, for your kind attention. The United Kingdom as Indispensable Party. Madam President, distinguished judges, it is an honor to address you and to continue Venezuela's argument after the coffee break. You have, before the coffee break, heard my colleagues set out the facts on which Venezuela's argument is based. It falls to me to demonstrate that these facts lead to one clear conclusion. The United Kingdom is an indispensable party in whose absence this case cannot proceed. I will develop the argument. Following this, my colleague, Professor Palchetti, will set out why the United Kingdom remains an indispensable party after Guyana's independence. 2. Madam President, Venezuela's argument rests on the jurisprudence of this court, and notably the monetary gold doctrine. The parties are agreed that this doctrine, if it applies, precludes the court from exercising jurisdiction. The initial formulation of the doctrine in the monetary gold case remains instructive. On the face of it, this was a dispute between Italy and the Allied powers about competing claims by Italy and Britain to monetary gold. But Italy's claim to the gold depended on the contact of Albania, who was accused of having violated Italy's rights. And as the court noted unanimously, to go into the merits of such questions would be to decide a dispute between Italy and Albania. This could not be done without Albania's consent, which had not been given. 3. Importantly, the court in 1954 reached its decision unanimously before the merits had been argued. When it declined to exercise jurisdiction, it was uncertain whether or not Albania's conduct was unlawful. But one thing was clear. A merits decision would have to address the matter, and this, the court found unanimously, could not be done. The Rationale of the Monetary Gold Doctrine 4. Madam President, in almost seven decades since monetary gold, this court has had much opportunity to clarify the purpose of the doctrine named after the case. In Venezuela's submission, the decision of the East Timor case and the Croatian-Serbian genocide case are particularly instructive as they identified the rationale of the doctrine. 5. First, East Timor. In that case, Portugal had claimed that Australia had acted unlawfully in agreeing to the Timor Gap Treaty with Indonesia, bearing on treaties belonging to East Timor. Australia objected. To decide on the case was brought by Portugal, the court, said Australia, would have to decide on the rights and competence of Indonesia in relation to East Timor. The court accepted this argument. It considered that Portugal's claim depended on a prior question. Could Indonesia enter into treaties concerning areas off the coast of East Timor? Contrary to Portugal's claim, Australia's conduct was not separable from that of Indonesia. In the words of the court, as you see them on the slide, the court could not rule on the lawfulness of the conduct of a respondent state when its judgment would imply an evaluation of the lawfulness of the conduct of another state which is not party to the case. The second case that Venezuela submits is instructive is the Croatian genocide case. My colleague, Professor Palcetti, will speak to it in more detail. I will merely highlight one, one aspect. The relevant section is on the slide. It is an assessment of the court's jurisprudence on the monetary gold doctrine. And in both Monetary Gold and East Timor, we read, the court declined to exercise its jurisdiction to adjudicate upon the application because it considered that to do so would have been contrary to the right of a state not party to the proceedings, not to have the court rule upon its conduct without its consent. 7. 
not to have the court rule upon the conduct of an absent third state, or in the similar terms of the East Timor judgment, no implied evaluation of the lawfulness of the conduct of another state. This, Madam President, distinguished judges, is the rationale of the monetary gold doctrine as shaped in the jurisprudence of this court. On the basis of this jurisprudence, Venezuela submits that this court must ask itself a simple question at the present stage. Would a judgment deciding on Guyana's application imply an evaluation of the lawfulness of the conduct of another state which is not party to the case, the United Kingdom? Or in the words of the Croatian genocide case, would a judgment in this case rule upon the United Kingdom's conduct without its consent? If the answer is in the affirmative, the court must decline to exercise jurisdiction. This is the test. The Monetary Gold Doctrine Application to the Present Dispute Madam President, based on this test, Venezuela's argument is straightforward. In order to settle this dispute, the court will, as a prerequisite, have to rule on the United Kingdom's conduct. This follows from Guyana's own memorial submitted on the 8th of March, 2022. It is confirmed by the presentation by my colleagues, Professor Aurelia and Esopito, Esposito, and it results from the court's judgment in this case of 18th December, 2020. Permit me to begin with this judgment, the judgment of 18th of December. In it, a majority of this court upheld jurisdiction over Guyana's claims. Importantly, paragraph 137 that you see on this slide clarified, clarified that not all of Guyana's claims came within the court's jurisdiction, only those concerning the validity of the 1899 award about the frontier between British Guyana and Venezuela, and the related question of the definitive settlement of the dispute regarding the land boundary between the territories of the parties. 10. With all respect, I note that not everything in this formulation is clear to Venezuela, but three matters are clear, and they all point to the central role of the United Kingdom highlighted by the Vice President in her opening speech. 11. First, this case is primarily about the validity of a disputed arbitral award rendered between Venezuela and the United Kingdom, disputed because Venezuela accused the United Kingdom of having acted fraudulently. 12. Second, the award whose validity is primarily at stake was rendered on the basis of a disputed arbitration agreement concluded between Venezuela and the United Kingdom, disputed because Venezuela complained of fraudulent British conduct. 13. Third, Guyana brought the case on the basis of the Geneva Agreement, another treaty concluded between Venezuela and the United Kingdom, a treaty that, as stated in its preamble, was meant to resolve a controversy between Venezuela and the United Kingdom, a treaty, treaty to which the United Kingdom remains a party until today. 14. Madam President, the judgment of 2020 was rendered against Venezuela's objections, but we live with its implications, and the key implication is that this case is now firmly a case about an arbitral award that triggered a British-Venezuelan controversy, a controversy peppered with allegations of fraud, deceit, and coercion, a controversy that Venezuela and the United Kingdom tried to diffuse through the mechanism of the Geneva Agreement. The United Kingdom is at the heart of the dispute as defined in the Court's 2020 judgment. 15. Madam President, how have the parties sought to deal with this judgment, and if I can put it in this way, the obvious monetary gold specter that it raised? I will begin with Guyana's memorial. Guyana, as a claimant, is free to formulate its claims, and of course Guyana has made use of this freedom to present this dispute in a way that minimizes the role of the United Kingdom. Guyana's counsel are no strangers to monetary gold, so it comes as no surprise that Guyana's memorial relies on the trusted techniques of parties that seek to avoid the implication of the monetary gold doctrine. It presents the dispute as one about abstract legal issues, and it seeks to gloss over the role of the indispensable party, in this case the United Kingdom. It does so with respect to both the Arbitration Agreement of 1897 and the 1899 award rendered on its basis, but Madam President, with respect to both agreement and the award, the United Kingdom cannot be glossed over. The Court cannot assess the validity of the Washington Arbitration Agreement without evaluating the conduct of the United Kingdom. 16. Let me begin with the Arbitration Agreement. On the slide, you see the main headings of Guyana's memorial insofar as it addresses this issue. To be clear, this is the agreement that Venezuela had attacked before the United Nations, arguing that it had been deceived and pressured to accept it. But if you look at Guyana's memorial, or the main headings, you would not know. Guyana presents the Venezuelan-British controversy as an abstract legal question of validity in which the United Kingdom has no role. Guyana seeks to do what Portugal sought to do in East Timor case. It seeks to decouple its claim from the underlying legal issue so as to steer clear of monetary gold. And so Guyana says, and you see it on the slide, that it says no fraud. It says no coercion. It says Compress was valid validly concluded. Everything is in the passive. In Guyana's memorial, there is no actors in the headings. 17. But Madam President, just as Portugal's attempt in East Timor, this only goes so far. There's no fraud without fraudsters. Coercion means one state has to coerce another state. If Guyana asks you to find no corruption in the heading, it really asks you to find that the United Kingdom has not corrupted. If it asks you to find no coercion, then it really asks that is that the United Kingdom did not coerce, and did not coerce enough to make the treaty invalid. Or did not. 
18. While Guyana seeks to define the United Kingdom away from this, the dispute, it is very clear from my colleagues' presentations that it cannot succeed. Professor Aurelia has pointed you to evidence suggesting that the United Kingdom, in negotiations with the United States, materially prejudiced Venezuela's position by insisting on the principle of prescription. Evidence indicates that Venezuela was deceived about this. Other evidence that you have been shown suggests that the United Kingdom pressured Venezuela to accept a tribunal with British judges, but no Venezuelan arbiters because, as you've been shown, in the view of the United Kingdom, there were no Venezuelan arbiters worthy of the name in the view of Great Britain at the time. 19. In light of this evidence, the real questions that this court will have to confront are not abstract. They implicate the United Kingdom. Did the United Kingdom coerce Venezuela? Did the United Kingdom act fraudulently? Should this case reach the merits, you would hear full argument on the matter, and you would be asked to evaluate Guyana's and Venezuela's competing claims on the validity of the arbitration agreement, that unworthy treaty in the words of Hector Gross, SPL. And any finding of invalidity would, of course, have very real consequences for Venezuela and the United Kingdom. My colleague, Professor Palchetti, will speak to this. For present purposes, all the matters that is a merits judgment would have to evaluate the conduct of the United Kingdom, precisely what monetary gold doctrine seeks to preclude. The court cannot assess the validity of arbitral award without evaluating the conduct of the United Kingdom. 20. Madam President, members of the court, permit me to move on to the arbitral award itself. Can its validity be assessed without assessing the conduct of the United Kingdom, one of the two parties in the proceedings of the main and beneficiary outcome? 21. Again, I begin with Guyana's memorial, and we see the same strategy at play. Guyana presents the question of validity as an abstract one, as one not implicating the United Kingdom if we look at the headings. 22. On the slide, you see them. You see that Guyana speaks in the second Roman heading of Venezuela's allegations of corruption, collusion, as if these allegations had been made in the abstract. The headings you see are mostly about the tribunal. It fulfilled its, uh, its functions, asserts Guyana. It properly exercises its functions, it says in the opening line. It produced a legally valid award, and its written observations, Guyana takes this to the extremes. This is what it says in paragraph 21. The award's validity depends on the lawfulness of the conduct of the arbitral tribunal, not on that of the UK, is what Guyana says. 23. Madam President, with all due respect to our colleagues, it seems to me that this attempt to read the United Kingdom out of the history is getting desperate. It is desperate because if a tribunal is corrupt, someone must have corrupted it. Desperate because, it, by definition, you cannot collude on your own. And desperate also because to present its clean take on the British-Venezuelan controversy over the arbitral award, Guyana has to erase from record Venezuela's very real charges of fraud of deceit, which were charges made against the United Kingdom. 24. And it is when reading beyond the headings that we see that even Guyana in its memorial cannot ignore the United Kingdom. Venezuela invites the court to look carefully at sections 2E and 2F of chapter 8 of Guyana's memorial, in which Guyana addresses some of Venezuela's claims. These sections are, in essence, a defense of the United Kingdom's conducts. I cannot take you through all the material, but permit me to take you to two excerpts. 25. The first excerpt concerns the problem of tampered evidence of doctored maps used in the proceedings. On the slide, you see reproduced an exact from paragraph 8, 54 of Guyana's memorial, and it speaks there to Venezuela's allegations. Quote, the 1965 report, that is the report in which Venezuela compiled many of its concerns about the award, asserts that Venezuela has evidence that lines marked in maps dated 1841 and 1842, which were presented to the tribunal, have been tampered with by the colonial office. Venezuela also alleges that Great Britain falsely represented that a map of the Schomburg line presented to the tribunal was a map that had been produced by Schomburg in 1844. 26. The court is aware of these maps. From the presentation by my colleague, Professor Carlos Esposito, just before the coffee break. But it is clear from this passage that you see on the slide, Guyana is also aware. And what is more, Guyana knows that in order to uphold the validity of the award, it has to defend the United Kingdom against Venezuela's charges. And this is exactly what Guyana's memorial does. Please have a look at the following sections, which set out, if I may say so, Guyana's defense of the United Kingdom. They are from roughly the same section of the memorial, still paragraph 854 and paragraph 860. Please let me read the relevant excerpts to you. This is what Guyana says. Quote, Venezuela has not provided any particulars in support of its allegations that maps were tampered with, nor has it explained how and why those maps were supposedly of decisive importance to the tribunal's determination. Now, six paragraphs on from this we read, the evidence shows that far from seeking to deceive Venezuela and the tribunal, Great Britain candidly acknowledged the limitations of the various maps upon which it relied and proactively drew attention to the amendment to the erroneous map which Venezuela now seeks to characterize as an improper and secret amendment that was concealed from the tribunal. That was Guyana speaking. 27. If I put this in my own words, I might say Guyana argues that the United Kingdom's tampering has not been proven. That is the opening of paragraph 854. 
or that there may have been tampering with maps, but we cannot be sure about its effects on the award. That would still be 854. In paragraph 860, we see another line of defense. In my own words, Guyana seems to accept that the United Kingdom tampered with maps, but perhaps its bad faith had not been fully established. 28. Now, we do not know whether this court would accept Guyana's, if I may say so, benevolent reading of the United Kingdom's conduct, or whether it would follow Venezuela's assessment, namely that the United Kingdom's tampering with the evidence vitiates the award, with all the legal consequences that this has for the relations between the two parties to the award, Venezuela and the United Kingdom. But at this stage, it is irrelevant. What is relevant is that both parties, Venezuela, but also Guyana, ask the court to rule upon the conduct of the United Kingdom. 29. Madam President, the tampered maps are just one example of disputed British conduct. There are others, and again, to appreciate as much, we need to look no further than to Guyana's memorial. 30. Section 2F of Chapter 8 of this memorial contains a lengthy defense of the United Kingdom, a defense against another charge initially set out in the memorandum of Severo Maleprovent, referred to by the Vice President, published in 1949 posthumously in the American Journal of International Law. In that memorandum, there was the following allegation. There was some deal between Great Britain and Russia which, by which the two powers induced their representatives on the tribunal to vote as they did. Now, clearly, Guyana does not accept this claim. It disputes it. But to dispute it, it goes to great lengths to evaluate the United Kingdom's conduct. In official British Foreign Office documents, says Guyana, there is no evidence of a deal. Great Britain at the time speculates Guyana would have unlikely to strike would have been unlikely to strike a deal with Russia. The two British arbiters, states Guyana, did not, as al alleged by Venezuela, travel to the United Kingdom with Professor Martins to meet British government officials, and so on and so forth. Chapter 8, Section 2, F of Guyana's Memorial contains Guyana's lengthy defense of the United Kingdom. Guyana's suggestion on how you should rule on the United Kingdom's conduct. Guyana invites you to do exactly what the monetary gold doctrine seeks to preclude. I note in passing that Guyana is surprisingly silent when it comes to other evidence pointing to fraudulent conduct. We are waiting to hear how Guyana will respond to the specifics of Venezuela's claim as presented by Professor Esposito, and in particular to the clear evidence that, throughout the arbitral proceedings, Britain's senior counsel, Mr. Webster, was in frequent, and if I may say so, deeply irregular, contact with the United Kingdom's arbiters. Professor Esposito has spoken to this. I will merely recall two statements. 32. The first is Mr. Webster's candid admission in a letter to Lord Salisbury that if he had any reason to believe the tribunal is against me on this part of the case, he would happily let the British arbiters know our point of view on the position. And 33. The second statement is also on the slide. Mr. Webster's perhaps even more candid admission that there were necessary, his word, necessary, he would, even more candid admission, were necessary, his word necessary, he would be happy to take independent action privately through our arbiters. You have it all there, our arbitrators. Professor Esposito referred to that. 34. We do not know whether Guyana sees this as another instance of no fraud, to take the term of the heading of its memorial, whether in light of these statements Guyana will cling to and affirm its, if I may say, frankly astonishing position that whatever fault there was only, uh, could only be the tribunals, but could not implicate Great Britain. But most fundamentally, how does Guyana suggest the impact of the United Kingdom's conduct during the proceedings could be assessed without ruling on the lawfulness of this conduct? 35. Madam President, members of the court, this brings me to the end of my presentation. As I conclude, permit me briefly to step back from the details. This is, as you have heard my colleagues say frequently, the preliminary objection stage of the case. We are not meant to plead the merits. But in order to allow the court to rule on the preliminary objection, Venezuela has had to highlight that like Australia in East Timor, like Italy in monetary gold, what a hypothetical merits case might look like. 36. Even from this limited discussion, it is clear that the United Kingdom's conduct, which Venezuela attacks and Guyana defends, would be the very subject matter of any decision that the court would have to render if it reached the merits of Guyana's claim. To reiterate, Guyana asks you to uphold the validity of a disputed award rendered in the United Kingdom's favor, an award rendered on the basis of a disputed United Kingdom-Venezuela treaty that bears all the hallmarks of unworthy 19th century treaty making that hopefully we have left behind. An award over which Venezuela and the United Kingdom quarreled and argued for decades. Now this argument was not about abstract questions. It was fundamentally about the conduct of the United Kingdom and about the consequences of its conduct. Should it be found to have been unlawful, Britain's conduct as a colonial power scheming to usurp the territory of an independent state in Latin America, Britain's handling or mishandling of evidence, Britain's potentially fraudulent behavior during arbitral proceedings, and the consequences flowing from such fraud if established. To state that the United Kingdom is to this case what Indonesia was to East Timor would be a gross understatement. It is the heart of the case. 
37. And so, in concluding, Venezuela leaves you with a simple question, adapted from the language of the Croatian genocide case. Would you, in deciding upon Guyana's claims, have to rule upon the United Kingdom's conduct without its consent? In Venezuela's submission, the answer to this question is a resounding, yes, you would. And this is why the court is precluded from exercising jurisdiction. Madam President, this concludes my presentation. I'm grateful for you and your colleagues' kind attention. I would ask you to call upon Professor Paolo Palcetti to continue Venezuela's presentation. This then continues in French. And so that represents the argument that Venezuela made to the World Court in English. There's quite a bit additional in French, but I'm not going to translate that. That would be an astronomic amount of work. And sorry about the dog who's so excited that I'm suddenly recording. Uh, but it gives you an idea of what Venezuela is saying. And I think that um, at the very least, you have to give them a certain amount of uh, credit for having a valid uh, approach to this, right? They have evidence. They have logic. They have law. Maybe they're incorrect. Maybe some of those things are not true. It only takes so much not being true for the whole thing to fall apart. But their theory is a sound one. And what we've gotten a lot of from Guyana is, or people claiming to be representing Guyana in, in their points is um, ignoring these points, saying, well, they have no proof. Well, or they've provided no proof. That doesn't mean it's not inaccurate, but that none has been provided. That is not true. Some has been provided since the beginning, and it has been submitted to the courts. So that is that is false, right? So that argument is based on false things. Um, and the, the logic behind it uh, seems very reasonable. It's, it feels very hard to argue against. Of course, Guyana had a counter argument, uh, as did the court in the time since then, in, in quite a bit of time since then, because this was many months ago. Uh, the court determined, uh, at least on in one part, that they can hear the case. That does not mean that they can, right? Venezuela, I believe, has to agree to that. And as a sovereign state, they are currently not agreeing to that necessarily. And they've pointed out why. Um, because uh, to them, this is a second ca court case that is not authorized by them, um, that is partially controlled by a foreign government that is uh, multiple foreign governments that are antagonistic to them. So there's there's little chance of, of having even a fair trial. Um, and uh, it is it is done without the party in question being there. Guyana's claim is based completely uh, on being handed the land by the UK. That land was in dispute at the time. Um, and so it Guyana took it as a disputed territory. It has always been disputed. Guyana has never owned that territory. It has only controlled that territory. That's very important. Anyone who says that it's always been Guyana, that is false. Guyana, at the time of its creation, this is black and white. This is not in dispute anywhere. Always, that was a disputed territory that had to be resolved. Now they're trying to finally get it resolved. Any use of, well, it's, it's Guyana's, it should just be Guyana's, is just tacit admission that it's Venezuela's, right? All those people who are posting that, well, it's been Guyana's, they're lying because they don't have actual points other than come and take it. This is about force of arms and not about the law, not about rights, not about history. And maybe that is the, the accurate undertaking, but it is an admission. All those people read the posts that will show up on this because they won't watch the video and watch my other one. And people will simply ignore all these things and lie about the basics, not about the parts that are in dispute. You write, does Venezuela have evidence of, of bad things having happened in 1899? Absolutely they do. Is it correct? Is it true? We don't know. That's gray. But do they have they presented evidence? Yes, they have. So all those claims that there is no evidence, that's not true. And the United States recognized evidence uh, ahead of the actual 1899 meeting. So there, there's little dispute on any of that. Even England has admitted to some of those things. So th those are open. There was problems. Are they significant enough uh, to, to uh, derail the underpinnings of the 1899 agreement? That is the stuff that Venezuela says it is clearly, on their side, uh, going to derail that. And what I've seen so far... Uh, from Guyana is not disputing that it is uh, not enough. And from essentially all the people who have been posting pro-Guyana points in my thread, none of them are disputing it either. None of them are addressing it, which tells me they believe that the 1899 agreement was invalid and they don't want to talk about it. They are unwilling to talk about it because they know that. Because that's why every everybody posts something that's misdirection. Venezuela's point is what they presented here, that 1899 is invalid and you can't try to change it by doing something unrelated now. 
right? Those are those are they're disconnected. This, this is about uh, a disagreement with the UK in 1899. UK is not being brought into the table now. Guyana is not a party to what Venezuela is discussing, uh, and so this is this is a different discussion. Guyana's approach is seems to be misdirection. Certainly, the people who are talking pro Guyana in the post are talking misdirection. I don't know the Guyana themselves are. They're mostly just saying, "What are you going to do about it? We're in the Commonwealth, and not being a completely sovereign country, since they have the king of England that is the actual landholder in Guyana, and all of it belongs to him. He's very likely to send warships, and the U.S. is going to look the other way because that's how the U.S. behaves uh, when uh, the U.K. wants to to take military action against." Against the Monroe Doctrine, which not that I support the Monroe Doctrine, but these are these are the likely outcomes, right? Guyana is going to call on their parent country that they they hate to admit that they have a king, they hate to admit that they're a former colony that is not completely separated, they're still in the Commonwealth, um, but that is the truth, right? Those are factual things. They still have the King of England is their head of state and uh, or their head of government, whichever it is, it's one or the other, and uh, and that they're part of the Commonwealth. And so they're, they're in a group of colonies um, that are semi-sovereign, but not completely sovereign, as Australia found out a number of years ago, which is why they separated, uh, because they discovered their lack of sovereignty was much more shocking than they had realized uh, as, a, as a people. Um, so look at that history. It's very interesting uh, as to leaving the Commonwealth. But uh, in that role, all of the people I have seen, maybe I've missed some, who post points for Guyana are actually just posting the obviousness that they believe that Guyana has no leg to stand on, that they clearly believe Venezuela is correct, because if they believed Guyana was correct, they would present arguments for that. And maybe one or two people have, I'm not saying it's 100%, but really go read them with the eye that what if Venezuela was correct, the things that they're saying are clearly misdirection and clearly nonsensical. Right or based on other things, we'll we'll dig into that in another uh, another episode. But I, I think it's good to hear Venezuela's side on this um, from a direct source, not an interpretation. Right? I just read their court filings um, because I think it's pretty clear and easy to follow. And then once you realize that that's what the filing is, reading the things that people say, uh, claiming to be pro Guyana, and for all we know, they're pro Venezuela, just pretending to be Guy um, Guyanese uh, to to create uh, animosity. Um, so that's that's plausible, of course. Um, but uh, when you read the things that are posted, um, it's really black and white that those people clearly don't believe in Guyana's case at all. Um, so if Guyana's, if the, if the, the, the Guyanese do not uh, have any faith in their in their position, um, it, it tells us a lot about exactly what's going on here. So uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, I know for a lot of you, this is not content you're normally looking for, but this has kind of cropped up as an important thing. There's, there is some coverage on this worldwide, but it, it's relatively little. And the Essequibo is a really interesting region and a really important bit of uh, current colonial history uh, unfolding here in Latin America. Um, and for a lot of us, it's a lot of concern, right? We are in the 21st century and we are dealing with colonial powers still attempting to manipulate uh, things here on the ground um, in, in many directions, right? There, it's, it's more than one simple thing, uh, but we're, it shows just how much uh, the Americas, especially Latin America, struggles to free itself of um, colonial and imperial uh, intervention from Europe um, and how little uh, countries here are treated as being truly sovereign, right? Even the world court situation, right? Oh, well, there's a dispute between supposedly two countries in the Americas. So some Europeans need to preside over this to make a determination. Just the concept of that, right, shows how little uh, credence is given to this part of the world as being truly sovereign. They're still viewed as being uh, child states who are property to at least some degree uh, by their European powers. And that's exactly what's what's playing out in many of the, in much of this, right? Um, and and I think it should be viewed in that in that way to some degree that this is this is truly. European powers trying to decide another part of the world, which is exactly how most problems in the world have gotten to where they are uh, today as it is. So we already know this is a terrible process, that this is how the world feels it needs to play out um, is, is very problematic uh, in a lot of ways.